there's no such thing as nonspecific pain. It's always very specific. And those who can't find the mechanism, my students, I used to say, you missed something. Go back and look again and you will find it. Change what you're assessing. Be more creative. Understand the sport. Get in the kayak. Work. Become a master of the craft. Go roll with GSP. Go roll with, you know, a Gracie. Dr. McGill, thank you so much for joining us. Well, good morning, Stephen. It's uh, e even earlier for you in uh, Vancouver. Yeah, what's a few time zones in the modern <laughs> world? I think it's fair to say that you're considered to be one of the world's foremost experts on the human spine. And this is a title that comes up again and again. And the number of lifters that refer to you and refer to your work and the number of athletes that refer to you and your work is just incredible. So my first question is, how do you become an expert in the human spine? It's not a course you take. It's not a, a book you read. So, so how do you go about becoming that? Well, certainly if you spoke to my high school teachers, they never would have predicted anything like this. And it was certainly a, uh, a journey where I never knew it was uh, where the destination was. So if you're asking me today, what, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'd still have to answer like I was 16. I said, well, I'll probably like to be a firefighter. <laughs> <laughs> but well, you have the mustache uh, it, for it. It was a, a <laughs> it was a journey that was just unscripted. Uh, crazy things happened. I, in high school, had no intention to go to university. I was going to plumbing school. And it was uh, the football coach who asked me to come back. Oh, come back and play another year. And, and then uh, some universities were interested. And I, I went uh, in that regard. And then I uh, discovered the world of science from some outstanding professors. And here's a kid, I couldn't learn calculus to save my life in high school. And yet when I got to university, I remember the first calculus class, the professor says, you don't need to know what limits are or anything like that. It's simply something changes as a function of something else. So if water flows through a pipe and you neck down the diameter, the pressure in the flow rate goes up. And I said, you're kidding me, that's what calculus is? And little things like that just just kickstarted my life. So all of a sudden, chemistry became mechanics, became mathematics, became physics, and it all rolled together. And then anatomy came along and, and human physiology and, and whatnot. Uh, so I finished off my undergrad. I did a, a master's in biomechanics at University of uh, Ottawa and then a PhD in spine biomechanics at uh, University of Waterloo simply because I met a professor at a hockey game. Uh, I, I was with the uh, professor's team of Ottawa and he was on the University of Waterloo team and, and the teams get together for beers afterwards. And he says, oh, come and see my laboratory. I'm just starting a spine mechanics laboratory. So that's how that started. And then I became a professor um, and, and this is, you, you were asking, how do you do it? And, and my initial response to that was attitude, like so many things in life. And I'm very interested in things that I'm interested about. And you work to become a master of the craft. So you've worked to uh, become a master of the craft with your grappling skills and your strength skills. Uh, if I know that about you, I would make a bet that you are also a master of the craft and the skills of fighting fires. I just, again, I'm putting together pattern recognition here. So uh, our first laboratory we developed was an in vivo laboratory where we measured real people doing things. A lot of them were athletic events because they stressed the body. So it was very interesting to me. And uh, we measured muscle activation patterns and spine curvatures and stress distributions and finally spine stability. Very few people actually measured spine stability, but we were one of the uh, first groups to do that. And uh, learning why people are able to survive and prosper doing some things and yet it breaks another. It's a, there's a great variation and there's a reason for it. Then I developed the in vitro lab where we took real spines and 
applied those forces that were causing people difficulty and we measured the tissue damage. So we were Are then you talking about able... animal spines or human spines or? All spines, obviously. So you would have an actual spine in the lab? Absolutely. We would collect uh, animal spines, uh, the local pig abattoir uh, in Kitchener. <laughs> you probably know who that was, would supply us with spines. And we could get 50 identical spines. So we could run a controlled study. We would do uh, something on 25 of them and something else on the other 25 and see what happens to them. And then I developed a radiology suite. So now all of a sudden we could read CAT scans and x-rays and uh, ultrasound and all these sorts of things linking pain pathways and mechanisms in people. Then about 20 years ago, uh, I kept being asked by the clinical community to come and do talks. Tell us what you're learning about how the spine works. And they would say, oh, that's, that's interesting. Would you come and see this patient for us? Because what you just showed us seems to be the missing link. And uh, I became a little bit more confident in dealing with uh, back pain patients. And so I started the experimental research clinic at the university and I set aside two hours to see a spine patient. And my medical colleagues would say to me, are you crazy? What are you going to do for two hours? We, we spend 10 minutes with a back pain patient. And do you know, Stephen, after two, after the first year, I increased that time to three hours because it was that length of time that's required to, for the first time, listen to that person's story do pattern recognition and then hone the tests that will reveal what truly is their pain mechanism or reasons for un, uh, underperforming and whatnot. And, and they're, they're highly related. And then uh, pay enough attention as to developing the skills of coaching so that, you know, uh, I'm sure in your career, you've, you've worked with some highly explosive athletes. Now think of every explosive athlete you've dealt with. They were bordering on attention deficit. In other <laughs> words, you had 30 seconds to get your message across as a coach. Now, if you had a more durable athlete, less explosive, you could explain things. And they, so do you see even the coaching style had to match their, their learning style. Uh, and then, uh, we, uh, did epidemiological trials, clinical trials. So to become a master of the craft, which is, I, I think what the question was, it was just, uh, 24 seven dedication to these various, um, opportunities that came together and you just keep working it. And I've been retired from the university uh, five years. And uh, it, still to this day, I see patients and every single one of them is really an experiment and something to study and probe and understand their pain. And, uh, and I continue to learn. If I've heard any criticisms to your work, they fall into one of two areas. And I'd love to hear your response to them. I'm sure you have responses. The first is that studying a dead spine in a lab is not the same as studying a living spine in a person, that the, that the repair mechanisms that are going on in a real person are not uh, present in a dead spine. Uh, and, the, and the second well, is well, the pain mechanisms. Hold on. This is the second podcast I've done okay. today, so <laughs> I'm a bit fatigued. Oh, just let's oh, do sorry. one at a time. <laughs> so uh, th that's fair. It's rather unfortunate because there are people on the Internet who don't know our work, have never worked with us, and they'll say, oh, McGill worked on pig spines because they read one right. study. Well, about 10 percent of our work was on pig spines. They, they, they don't know the breadth of what we did. So, of course, uh, if that were true, that's a very valid criticism. But we published work showing that the pig cervical spine is very similar to a human lumbar. Think of a quadruped. If I have to walk around on all fours... Uh, I, I then have to create a jib crane out of my neck. Pigs have big extensor muscles in their neck because they have to hold their neck up. They root for food, etc. They've developed a big lumbar spine. Now, if I gave a pig cervical spine to a human surgeon, as I have done, do you know they don't even know it's a pig oh, really? spine? It's that close in some, yeah, it is. So the, uh, but we used adolescent spines because we didn't want a lot of arthritis and, and things like that. Now, having said that, we would get the odd human spine. Uh, but 
I just said we get 50 identical pig spines. Now, who would you like to donate? Uh, find 50 human volunteers and, and give me those spines. So when you read the human studies, people die for a reason. They're either old or injured or diseased. So those spines are not representative of someone like you. You're not the chance of you dying and donating your spine tomorrow is very slim. Now, if we did get that spine, that's gold. That's very precious. And that's the spine that gives us the calibration to humans. So when you read the human studies and you'll see my name on a few of them, uh, the uh, way a pig cervical spine herniates, for example, if we use that particular mechanism, is, is very similar to a human. The, the same combinations of motions, postures, and loads uh, d don't vary. Now, what you don't get is the adaptation after, but then we get that from the in vitro lab. Uh, I could show you uh, case study after case study that we've documented a massive disc herniation and then complete resolution. And we can complete that. We can resolve it in 15 minutes in some people by doing a decompression procedure just manually with posture uh, on, on an individual. Or sometimes it might take, say, we have a jujitsu master who is so disabled now with their back pain, they can't train jujitsu anymore because of the disc bulge. And uh, we take out the jujitsu for a period of time, teach them spine hygiene to avoid that particular mechanism and get that disc bulge to resolve. And then the second part of the story is to get it to stiffen, to give it some resilience to get back to rolling again. And uh, as I suspect you may be aware, uh, we've done that with some very uh, high profile uh, uh, combative athletes who have competed in Abu Dhabi, the UFC, Bellator, etc. So I'll, I'll stand by that as evidence. But, you know, you don't run, run a I, I can't write a controlled clinical trial on on those particular fighters and publish it in a medical journal as case studies uh, because those aren't uh, uh, really accepted. But the levels of evidence are are uh, are very layered. Uh, but anyway, that's my response to those who are really ignorant of the breadth of the work and they'll try and dismiss it by, oh, that's an animal spine because they've read a paper. I think your answer is basically the same as the first answer, which is if you want to get good at something, you shine a light on it in as many different ways right. as you can. The clinical stuff or, or the in vitro stuff is one method that you're using to get at the biomechanics of the spine. And then the radiological stuff or working with actual people, there are several other rays of light that you're shining on the same topic. Well, you're exactly right. You know, consider every kind of human disease. There's not one that didn't start with animal studies. It's the animal studies that gives you the control and the understanding of even what to look for in the humans. And then, of course, uh, third stage is our human trials. So, of course, you have to do that with uh, human spines. But uh, humans are limited resources <laughs> in, in, in our game. Well, if I come across any 30-year-old human spines that have been ethically procured, I'll send them your way. Right. The second area of criticism is this idea that, yes, there's physical damage, but that physical damage doesn't always equate to pain. The classic example here that I've heard from doctors and physiologists is if you took a hundred people who had all the signs and symptoms and pain of a disc herniation and you magically dissected them, that you wouldn't find a hundred herniated discs. And conversely, if you took a hundred people who had actual herniated discs, that the uh, they wouldn't all exhibit the signs. They wouldn't all have the pain that's consistent with that disc herniation. It's kind of a decoupling of the, the, the physical damage and the pain. So that just because you have pain doesn't mean you have physical damage. Just because you have physical damage doesn't mean you have pain. That's probably a really big topic, and I'll give you a couple of minutes to... Yeah, well, this is uh, because there's an absence of assessment. Assessment is king. A very thorough assessment will link with precision the mechanism and the pain. So it may be that uh, 
they, uh, someone has gone to the MRI first. So if you go to the orthopedic surgeon and you walk in the office, chances are your MRIs are already on the screen. There are institutes in the U.S. where you send your MRIs in and they will determine whether they will operate on you or not. This is uh, just awful medical practice in my view. You always assess the patient first. Now, I'm going to do a quick little assessment here, follow along. I'm going to sit and I'm going to sit upright and I'm going to pull up on the stool and let's say that doesn't cause a symptom. Now I'm going to slouch and I'm going to flex and my left big toe just went numb, L5. I can almost guarantee that there caused a dynamic disc bulge and a compromise on the left sided, did I say my left toe? Yeah. Left sided fifth route. Now I go to the MR after I've done the assessment, bingo bongo, there's the open fissure, and then we're going to watch the fissure close as we change the mechanical precursor to that uh, mechanical effect. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll do an assessment and uh, I'll uh, write in my report, uh, X person has an underhooked nerve root on the femoral nerve root at L3, right hand side. They go to surgery and the surgeon read my report and he said, McGill, how did you know that the femoral nerve root was underhooked? And I said, because that's what the assessment showed. When I drifted the head back, the pain got worse in the front of their thigh, migrating the spinal cord into the underhook. Uh, do you want to see what it yeah, looks like? Sure. Here, one sec. So here is a uh, disc bulge, and, and this is made by the brilliant uh, Jerome Fryer from Nanaimo, BC, as a matter of fact. So you see a uh, open fissure or damage through the collagen there. So when we pressurize the nucleus, it creates hydraulic pressure outwardly. But if you delaminate the collagen, you now see that little red mark on the back of the disc. Watch the red mark and I'm going to squeeze and keep an upright posture. The disc squeezes, but nothing happens. Now I'm going to flex. Driving the hydraulic pressure posteriorly, now do you see the disc bulge starting to grow. And now I'm going to reverse it. Now I'm going to play a little jazz. I'm going to have the person look down. That's an underhook. Watch the nerve root now on the bulge. As they look down, they pull the nerve root. Oh, I get some space here. Do you see the nerve root coming off the disc bulge? Now they look up. Do you see the nerve going down into the disc bulge? So when people say that, uh, it shows me that uh, they need a little bit more knowledge of the nuances of uh, the precise mechanism of pain, which you determine from the assessment, and then you will see whether it's on the MR. So that's the first half of the story. The second half of the story is this. You are a firefighter, you go to a uh, car wreck and you have to extricate a body. But how do you know all the damage in the car was done at that instant in time or the person had been driving around with a bashed in car for the last five years? You don't know from the MR. The MR shows the entire history of that person's life. All of the old scars, 30 years ago they did something to their back, but it's a scar. It doesn't cause pain, but a wound that was caused last week is active and a pain generator. So now you've got to be savvy enough to know what are wounds and what are scars. How do you do that? You do that through the assessment of the person to really lock down what is their current pain mechanism today. Then, only then, after you do, you go to the medical image and determine whether that's an active uh, wound or uh, an old pain-free scar. So I come right back to the assessment is king. And uh, that's how I would address that uh, criticism. Again, comes from people who uh, don't have the skills uh, in the ability to uh, diagnose. Well, that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that. And in the process of refuting those criticisms, you managed to do a ton of teaching, which is which is a very cool thing. Can we pivot 
perhaps to the athletes that you've worked with? I mean, I'm a combat athlete, but I actually found about found out about you first through the lifting community. Uh, guys like Chris Duffin and many other power lifters and weightlifters have referred to you and they found your stuff incredibly useful and are huge evangelicals of your work. And then uh, also the combat athletes, which I found out about after. If you can, could you mention some of the people that you worked with in, in both arenas? Yeah, well, it, that's the key. You realize that every person who, n no one comes to me for any other reason that they have a disabling back injury. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that brings them under HIPAA and uh, they're a medical uh, patient and I'm not allowed to say who comes, but I can tell you, I see, uh, prime ministers, uh, Royal family members around the world, uh, top athletes. I think, uh, two Olympics ago, I had 40 Olympians who I had seen getting them ready through their back pain for the uh, Olympics. So virtually, uh, over the years, virtually every Olympic sport, almost every professional sport. But you asked about powerlifting. Chris Duffin, have you read Chris's book, by the way? I have, yeah. Yeah. Isn't it a wonderful book? It's really amazing that that man's alive. He is just a, a force of nature. I, I truly love him. He's a, a wonderful fella. Well, I saw him just before he did his uh, squatting a thousand pounds, I think a thousand pounds for two, two and a half reps. Yeah. Well, Chris was the lightest man in history to pull a thousand from the floor, but that was after pretty uh, nasty disc bulge. And he'll tell you he used our principles to rebuild his body uh, to be able to do that. Brian Carroll who just set the all-time world record squat, 1,306 uh, pounds. Now, he came to me in 2013 with a split pelvis, or sorry, a split uh, sacrum, uh, just crushed L5. If, uh, if We wrote a book together called The Gift of Injury, and it was the story of his recovery back to the uh, platform. Uh, we just have to write the epilogue now that he is, uh, now that he's lifted the 1306. But anyway, uh, uh, I can talk a little bit about the nuances of, of getting him out of pain. That's always stage one. Too many people are unsuccessful because they think that they can still train and get out of pain all at the same time. Most of the time, that's a fallacy. Number one, the first goal is get out of pain. Then you can morph the goal into performance training again. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, th there, there's been literally, I could think of a hundred power lifters. There's women who've set world records. Uh, I think of Andy Bolton. He was the first man in England to pull a thousand. Uh, well, if you go to our website and look at the bottom, you'll see a testimonial from uh, uh, Andy Bolton. Bill Kazmaier, world, world's strongest man, wrote the forward to uh, Gift of Injury. Blaine Sumner, who has the highest Wilkes score of all time. Uh, that's the highest body normalized bench press, squat, and deadlift. Uh, he wrote the uh, back page of the book. He will tell you why he is still lifting. Uh, I can, many Westsiders, uh, I, I mean, again, I, I don't want to, 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 you get an idea that uh, I, I've been around powerlifting. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'm not saying you can reveal yeah. his name, but if people were to go to YouTube and uh, search for Stuart McGill, George St. Pierre, they'd find a video of you working yes. with him. Uh, so I'm not bound by HIPAA. I can totally reveal that. Yeah, there's quite a few with uh, combat athletes. Um, now, George's case was uh, very uh, particular uh, in that he didn't have back pain. So I'll, he, he didn't come to me for that. And, and the story behind that was his strength and conditioning coach was John Chamberg. So if you're into the UFC, you will know John Chamberg. He's a top uh, strength and conditioning coach for uh, uh, MMA athletes. Uh, a lot of the TriStar, the, the big names at TriStar. An entire generation of Montreal MMA fighters worked with him. 
Absolutely. So, John, again, you know, we're talking about mastery of the craft. John is a master of the craft for a reason. He invited me to Montreal and say, would you come and show us a few things with with some of my fighters? And and George at the time was one of them. And uh, some other, uh, uh, I can think of two or three that at one point in their career, they, they fought for the division weight division championship in the UFC. So these were no slouches. And uh, a lot of what uh, I did in that first study of which George was a part of, it was measuring the neurological gift that those fighters have. In other words, uh, when we measured who hits really hard in the UFC, for example, it's not the guys with the big muscles. They uh, tend to spread out the impulse and they push their punches versus, you know, the typical pulse. And then you got to relax to get the speed. And so they pulse and then hip turn, hip turn, hip turn, flash. And then at that time of impact is a second pulse. So when George hits you with that jab, trust me, you'd rather be hit by a Honda because that is 177 pounds of stone that comes through at that instant of impact. So we were the first to document the neurology of pulsed strength and uh, look out because those are the guys who can knock you out. out. Yeah. From any angle. And as you know, the, that to create the hip turn rotates the brain. That's probably the most potent, uh, knockout. Uh, but, the others that we've measured as well. And I've measured some pretty good boxers as well, who believe it or not, as a cohort hit harder in, in an arm strike. But some of the leg strikes are just, as you know, they're ungodly. I don't know how a human can stand and uh, take one of the kicks lateral to the thigh for, for, for a, you know, a skinny, Repeatedly. yeah, for a skinny old man like me, it's just, uh, but, you know, I could say that with an NFL offensive tackle who, you know, you just feel their strength. It's, it's just so I have a story for you. I was measuring some competitors in the uh, strongman, uh, you know, that event that's held every year. And uh, we were measuring the fellow who won the super yoke. They get under the yoke and they see who can carry it the furthest, which is massive core stability. If you don't have frontal plane core stability, you can't do it because it's the core that holds the swing leg up and allows you to swing. And if you don't have the big core, your pelvic platform bends a little bit and that shuts down neural drive. The brain perceives that as an unstable event and it just shuts you down. It's like having a little shift in your knee and your leg gives way. Your spine actually experienced the same neural shutdown or fuse box is probably a good analogy. And, and that's why core training is so key to uh, those athletes to to not allow that neural uh, shutdown. But anyway, uh, some of the scientists who are gait experts, they consider from the waist up a block and they don't measure it. Well, I'm a spine guy. I measure it. And uh, he required to do the super yoke 750 newtons newton meters of frontal plane torque to be able to walk and carry almost a thousand pounds on his back i think it was 780 or something i measured the hip abduction strength it was uh, about 500 newton meters in other words he laid on his side on the ground i laid on his foot and he just popped me up into the air laterally if you want to it was such an impressive ungodly display of strength but the the moral of that story was he had 500 newton meters of hip abduction strength, but he needed 750 to do the task. Where did the missing strength come from? Frontal plane core stiffness and stability. So, you know, I hear people say, oh, oh, here's another myth for you then. Uh, you know, uh, this this core work is is just a myth. It doesn't enhance performance. And I thought, oh, my goodness. These, these people probably don't have one world record to their name, and they'll say that. But they're good marketers on, on YouTube. <laughs> when they probably look nice, they probably have really wide shoulders. Uh, some do, some don't. <laughs> I, I, I hear all these things, mm. too, and all, all I, I, I never address them. I, I just let it slide and try and try and 
give a little bit of our science and just keep uplifting. That's all I can do rather than. So when it comes to not getting injured or not re-injuring yourself after a previous injury, what are some of your core principles for avoiding that injury or, or re-injury? I've seen interpretations of what you've said, but I'd be interested in hearing it from you. What do you think the most important things are people can focus on to not have that injury? Well, the answer, of course, is, you know, it depends. And it depends on the individual. What was their previous injury history and what was the mechanism of pain? So in the example I just gave you of that a strong man who won the super yoke, if he got injured in the super yoke, I'd be looking at frontal plane uh, athleticism and strength and say for that individual, that was probably the wink link. So let's work on that and make sure. Uh, so in a more general answer, working on the weak links and mm -hmm. Chris Duffin, there it is, Chris Duffin 101, <laughs> eliminate the weak links. And not only does that enhance your performance, but it increases your resilience. Instead of letting one part of your body carry 101%, uh, of the tolerance and then another part carrying 70%. Let's do a little technique change and bring them both up to 95. You've got a more resilient, higher performance now. Um, the, the, the history rule, maybe it's an example of, uh, let's take a canoeer. So I'm thinking of a great Olympian who was a kayaker, K1. They were a sprinter. What, what's the Olympic sprint distance? Is it one kilometer, thousand meters, or is it fifty? I don't know. I was always a whitewater guy. I was oh, okay. Never a racer. So the, I, I can't remember what the sprint distance is, but it's only two or three minutes, very short. And uh, they were an Olympic medalist, and now getting ready for the next Olympics, they were developing back pain. So they came in with their coach, and I, you know, to tell me about this. And then they said, well, our country has got a new kayak coach, and they believed in mileage. Go out on the lake and warm up paddling for five or six K before you start your sprints. And she says, I'm in pain. And uh, I said, all right. So I took her to the clinic, and I measured her just with a dowel, just uh, pulsing. And as you know, the great kayakers, as I mentioned in MMA, the great athletes, they're not strong grunt strength. They're strong pulsed strength, strategic pulses. It's the same with the kayakers. They uh, put the paddle in, they get to perfect angle, and then they pulse. Bang, bang, bang. Well, interestingly, as you know, the hips swivel in the kayak as well. And the more the hips swivel, the less the spine swivel. And uh, when the athlete was fresh, the spine was stacked and resilient, and that's where the pulse occurred. But the coach who believed in warming up made them tired. This athlete was a sprinter. What were they doing warming up with endurance? And they got tired, and then they started to miss time and miss fire. The hips ran ahead. So now they were deviated, and they pulsed. Bingo, that was the pain mechanism. So what was the cure? Don't warm up. Go back to your old style. So do you see how... Doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this. Don't right. do that. So do you see how precise this is? There's no such thing as nonspecific pain. It's always very specific. And those who can't find the mechanism, my students, I used to say, you missed something. Go back and look again and you will find it. Change what you're assessing. Be more creative. Understand the sport. Get in the kayak work, become a master of the craft, go roll with GSP, go roll with, you know, a Gracie. Now there is a style. If you, you know, the, it, 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 you don't feel a lot of strength, but the boa constrictor, when they start laying on some sort of a submission and they feel you resist, they back off, let it go. And they come in like a snake on something else. It's so, so clever. But uh, anyway, I'm getting off topic now because uh, you're talking my language. I'm loving this. This is wonderful. <laughs> so, Dr. McGill, if I had to summarize the, uh, the effect that I see that you've had on, say, the lifting and the sports community, kind of the Stuart McGill light 
version. <laughs> it, it's the effect that you seem to have had most often is an awareness that of the importance of having your spine in an anatomical neutral position while you're exerting load on the spine. So if you're deadlifting, lock your spine in position and then lift and don't flex or extend your spine while you're deadlifting. Or, you know, it's okay to bend and twist your spine in real life, but if you're, so if you're twisting to get a plate, that's fine. But if you're trying to move a heavy load or put to load your spine, that you don't want to uh, exert that load on your spine while it's twisting, while it's rotating. So you don't want the vertebra to extend or flex or rotate when there's load. Is, is that a fair characterization of one of your take-home lessons? Yes. Yes. Yeah, of course. So... Uh, Can you talk about what happens if you do flex, extend, or twist your spine under heavy load? Absolutely. I'm just trying to... Uh, to just give me... I'm going to get a sure. model for you here. So there are general, I, I'm getting your style now, Stephen, a little bit. So you, you ask a specific question, then you bring it back to the general, which is a nice style. I, I'm just getting to learn how to answer these a little bit. So, uh, uh, th th there's some big generalizations there. If you want the spine to be as resilient as you possibly can, uh, it's strongest when it's pretty close to neutral. The more spine power you create, the less your resilience. So as you know in jujitsu, a good powerful hip beats every other joint in the body every day. So jujitsu is all about getting hip power into the opponent for, for technique, correct? Yeah. To simplify the entire sport, you're using your hips to be your power base. Exactly. Bingo. So uh, if, a, if a power lifter, uh, so that's the very best, most resilient. Now the second best is let's say you're lifting an atlas stone. So now you have to curl and flex over a stone, but you are locked, you're locked around the stone. So we talk about the six hands of stone lifting. This, the two hands are the thighs where the stone is placed. Another two hands are these, your real hands, and another two hands are the pecs, and they actually become grippers on the ball. So when you lift the ball and you perform the, the final hip height hoik, you remain flexed and you lock your spine. Now that is still somewhat resilient because I showed you the nuclear gel that works its way through the delamination of the collagen that usually requires movement. So it's a combination. Um, but if you've got a, a bit of a disc bulge and a delamination already there, uh, that will get you into trouble usually. If you have a pristine spine, uh, then, then that you will probably be okay by being deviated and then locking it. So think of some of the shrimp moves in jujitsu, for example, fire with the hips if the person is discogenic. And that's one of the retraining principles that we will use for getting a, a jujitsu uh, athlete back. But there's so many layers to the question that you're, that you're asking. So here is a spine where this disc has been damaged. Does it show on an MRI? No. So, you know, you, you see the, the interesting discussions we can have. This disc is normal, L5. L3 is normal, but L4 has lost its stiffness. It's been uh, moved too many times under load. It's just simply lost stiffness. Now I'm going to move the spine. Do you see where the movement is occurring? All those micro moments, it's all at L4. Where do you think the pain is gonna come from? Now the pain pattern is very characteristic. The person will say, you know, oh, in the morning I had pain radiating into my right glute. This afternoon, it's uh, my left toe is going on fire. Oh, then it went up to my calf. That is a pattern of something is shifting. And now you're starting to see the shifts. And then you look at the facet joints that are being worked at the level of the disc that's lost in stiffness. None of this shows on MRI. But then people will, will dismiss and say, oh, well, you know, MRIs are useless. 
No, they're not. For the right kind of person, they're absolutely revealing for giving us guidance on how we're going to uh, perform movement hacks and retraining. Um, the next person uh, will, will watch their failure. Quite often in the assessment, clinicians don't know the sport, nor, I, I hate to say this, but they're physically soft. And I don't know any other way to put that. So they don't know what it's like to go to near death. If you want to get someone to know what it's like to have 800 pounds on your back for the first time, we'll go 110%. We'll put 880 on their back and just have them stand there and learn the neurology of what it feels like to have 110% when they've never been close to that. Is, is that cognitive behavioral therapy? I would say, yes, it's very powerful cognitive behavioral therapy. Is it neurological training? Yes, it's very important neurological training. Is it important biomechanical training? Yes, it's very, do you see? It's all very, very important when you start putting these things together. So um, let's uh, go to World's Strongest Man, uh, Mogadishu, Africa. I think that was 2019, a year ago. They had an event where the lads had to squat on this jig. It was about a 750 pound load and they had to squat to a depth and touch their buttocks to a box and get back up again. And uh, the winner, I think, got 17 reps. So it was really an endurance strength. And then, you know, you'd see someone uh, getting 12 reps uh, before they finished and whatnot. But watch every single time the mechanism was revealed it was instability of their spine so they would say they got to oops. oh i get so excited here being able to coach and demonstrate that i keep knocking the microphone off are you still there oh yeah Okay, we're still plugged in. Good. I've destroyed many a cable in my life. But uh, they'll they say they, they got to 12 reps. Watch this. So they failed on 12. Watch the 11th rep. And you'll see on the 11th rep, their spine just, it's a little shift. It's a little nuance, either through their hips. And so when we take an athlete to their failure point to understand why they get hurt when they start to get tired at the end of uh, uh, the, the endeavor, you'll see a compromise mechanism. So that is one where the neurological system shuts down. As soon as the brain feels that little hip slide, it shuts down the fuse box. Now, you're a firefighter. Uh, I happen to know the fella who, in the firefighters combat challenge, he won the IAFF, International Association of Firefighters. Com I used to compete in that. Okay, so you know the hose pull. And uh, so you're pulling in the hose like this. It's a, a, a heavy pull. And then when they get tired, they lock their hips and use their spine and overreach now. Guess what the injury mechanism is? It's loaded twisting. So does that start to get to your answer now? So I did... <laughs> I was all about loaded twisting. I, I not very fast, not very strong. So what I would do is try and compensate for that with wingspan, right? I got pretty long arms. So I would rotate my hips as far as I could and then rotate my spine further and grab as far down the rope as I could and then heave and rotate as far as I could the other way, pulling the rope past my body and then stretching with the other hand. So essentially trying to compensate for lack of speed with another attribute, which was wingspan. All right. So, so you did exactly what we would coach. So instead, it's the tendency of this fella to lock his hips and then get greedy and overreach to the spine, which disabled him, versus watch pull with the hip. Do you see me sinking back with the hip? Pull with the hip, hip, hip. Now, another trick is you pull the hose right through the spine, right through the navel, and minimize the twisting torque moment arm. Bang, 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 bang. And uh, the faster you can get it, the more momentum comes into the hose. I mean, I'm basically teaching them how to cheat, but that's what sport is. It's cheating through technique to uh, enhance effort. Uh, anyway, uh, so you, you, uh, give me an athlete who has pain. 
and if it's associated with with a sport that requires twisting, we will determine that. And then immediately we're going to give them the mechanical antidote. I'm just going to give you a movement hack like I just gave you now. Can you pull the hose with no pain? Now, who's going to argue with us that we haven't just found the mechanism and we found the antidote? Right. Now, I do want to move on to jiu-jitsu, which has some loaded rotation, but a ton of loaded flexion and extension, right? Forward and backwards movement. But before we move on, I, I, I've seen pictures of you canoeing, and I know you've worked with a ton of paddlers, and I've done a ton of paddling especially uh, back in the day, doing a lot of whitewater paddling. And essentially, you're, you're, you're sitting in a little tiny canoe and your hips are locked into a saddle. And uh, your power is coming from your spine rotating, right? The, the more you twist forward, the more spinal rotation you get, the better your form is and the more power you're generating. You, you can't get enough power just using your biceps and your lats without moving. So what's your hack there? Because by not rotating your spine, you are getting less power, which you need. Right. Or is this a no. case of, of I, I, I long-term pain for short-term benefit? Uh, you just spoke such wisdom in that sentence. So uh, I asked the athlete, what, what's your goal? And I've had uh, a government official, a minister of sport for a country contact me and say, we play the biggest match. I won't tell you who the sport because then you'll probably know it. But they called me and said, we are playing the biggest match in our history. It's very important that we beat this country just for the health of our, our, our country and its uh, uh, morale and all the rest of it. Um, can you help get this critical player ready to play? I said, well, when's the match? He says, six weeks. And I said, well, no, it, it's not possible. And he said, well, can you at least get him to play? And I said, well, uh, you can get him to play, but it may be the last game he ever plays in his life. And he said, it doesn't matter. That's what we're going to do. So that's my answer that I see in a lot of athletes who they don't think it's what they're doing now is pushing them past the tipping point. But they might very well uh, do that. Um, anyway, getting back to the uh, canoeing, uh, there are several strategies now. Uh, did you make the best effort and not you it's it's the theoretical kayaker that we're talking about here the 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 whitewater uh athlete did they act as an athlete 24 7 building capacity to have more pain-free reserve when they're actually in the kayak so that would be applicable to jujitsu or anything else but if they're slouching around uh you know all day long and then they want to sit in a kayak uh, and add even more cumulative exposure to that sitting twisting mechanism, mm. they were unprofessional. But, or maybe they just didn't know. But if we point out to them, here is a strategy to wind down your pain throughout the day, save the seated twisting for the, the kayak, because you have no option. You're right. You're, you're, you're strapped in. There's no option. Uh, there's no, no option on the jujitsu mat. For certain moves you will have to put your spine into that position it's the sport but now we're going to build more uh, capacity through practicing appropriate spine hygiene and exercises to address whatever existing deficits are um etc when we it, just let me go back to that previous powerlifting uh, example or the strongman and we watch the hips slide what we'll do uh, if that athlete was, say, limited at 12 reps and then they broke form and their brain shut down the neural drive, that means they still had more strength if they didn't make the movement mistake. So then we'll put a load on their back and we'll teach them to squat and then I might perturb the load. I'll put a hanging uh, dumbbell on it with a, with a band. Chris Duffin will tell you this. And then I'll swing it. So now they're riding the mechanical bolt. I want to see them correct that load, whereas their former self corrected it through their spine. Mm. The new self learns how to become a leaning tower, bigger feet, press the toes, work the heels, work the knees, work the hips, and migrate the corrective strategy to correct that thrust line error with a body part that isn't the one that's going to hurt. So there's another 
universal principle that I might take to any sport, including whitewater kayaking. So you you have sort of two solutions uh, to this issue, and the first is kind of the idea of a of a damage budget, where you have a certain amount of damage you can do to yourself, so you might as well do all that damage in your sport and not use up your damage budget by slouching that's, during the that's, day. That's a nice way to summarize it. Yeah. If slouching is the bugbear, it might not be. Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> of, yeah, that's a nice way avoid to put it. Avoid sledgehammer blows to the back. You know, No sledgehammer blows to the back if you're a whitewater paddler. Right. And the other is about building capacity through core training. Uh, is that correct? Well, it might be core. It might be neurological training, which is what sure, just did there. talked about there. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I don't know where my brain is going to go. It's based on the assessment once again. And then once we finish the assessment, we write down our priorities and it might be just simple hmm. technique. Uh, you know, again, neurological adaptations is all about creating muscle memory. You want the muscle memories or at least the default memories that the athlete goes to when they're tired to be the most conserving of the existing injury as possible. Are the issues we've been talking about in the context of paddling, which is rotation, the same in boxing? I mean, in boxing, there is rotation. I, there's a lot of hip rotation, but inevitably, there's rotation through the spine as well. Well, when you measure the great ones, there's much more hip rotation and much less spine, you know, at Mike Tyson as a, as a primary example. When that hook comes okay. around, he takes the drop steps, shifts, comes around, and it's out of the hip. Bam! That's, that's the power. The short little dirty mm -hmm. boxing hooks uh, from MMA, Muay Thai, it is the hip. Bam! Bam! You know, this isn't it. It is you talk the hips back, you lock the core, you drive through with the hip. Right. Uh, so I'm going to argue with you on that one. I, I would say no, it's uh, okay. not pristine coaching and technique. Hip, hip, hip. <laughs> Sorry. No, it, it's, it's, it's good. It's fine. I, and when you use the example of Mike Tyson, it's the perfect example because his whole body locks and then he used the power of his legs and the power of his hips to power that devastating hook well, watch a, a good well-trained gracie kick they don't kick you with a lot of spine rotation those are the duffers they will kick and then they snap the hip down okay. bam and that leg comes around like a baseball bat here to here is locked boom there's the kick did i twist my spine no or uh again you watch a jab it is hip you know a looping right hip <laughs> You watch Conor McGregor, 101. Yeah. He entices you in and he bangs you with his hip. It just comes around. Oh. Talk to Robin Black. Robin Black is the color commentator for Bellator. I don't know if you know Robin. Robin does fabulous breakdowns. Uh, I love working with him. You, you may have seen some of those uh, color uh, breakdowns. Oh, haven't but, actually. Uh, it's, uh, the biomechanics of knockouts? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll have to look so, it up. Yeah, the entire thing I missed with uh, Robin Black. He's been in this room here, actually, We've done some. Uh, but Robin is brilliant, and uh, he appreciates uh, hip power, shoulder power. I mean, there's no coincidence that the torso has a ball and socket at either end, so the power is generated at the hips and the shoulders, but it's transmitted through uh, a torso. Uh, if you want to run faster, if you want to dunk a basketball, there's an example. Try twisting your spine or bending it and dunk a basketball. It is not possible. The great dunkers, they create a core of stone and the hammer is usually the hip. Bam! And they fly through the air. Uh, so when the great dunkers start losing their uh, ability, they're a little bit later in their career, uh, we don't do squats and toe raises and things like that, which that's been attempted. They're still losing. We work on a stiffer core and a better hammer through the hip, neurologically and mechanically, to restore their dunk and their jumps. So to drag this back to jiu-jitsu, and in jiu-jitsu there's this idea of posture, right, where the, your spine is nicely aligned. And uh, if, if you and I are grappling and you manage to 
turn my neck one way and turn my hips the other way, yeah. you've hugely reduced my ability to get out of that position and made it much easier for you to submit me. I and mean, the same is true in Muay Thai. If you can bend my head, then... Of course. Yeah, it's in arm wrestling. It's in every sport. And, you know, there are physical therapists who say posture doesn't matter. And I just have to shake my head and say, oh, would you please come into the uh, octagon or onto the mat or something with 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 we're going to get a very modest looking person who is going to have you crying like a baby in two seconds who knows how to break you. <laughs> oh, By having posture and, matter all this of a sudden. Yeah. And then they, they'll say this to, uh, you know, uh, back pain to patients. So oh, posture doesn't matter. Are you kidding? The world will break you. So the flip side of that is in jujitsu with, are you, are you familiar with the inverted positions? Basically where you're in a yoga plow position where your shoulders are on the ground and your feet are also on the ground. And you're bridging up, you mean? No, it's the opposite of bridging. In bridging, oh, so you're, you're flat doing on a high your back. Guard? With your shoulders and your feet on the ground, you're lifting your hips up. But the inverting is if you were flat on your back and you oh yeah, it's a high bring guard. your legs back it. over your head. Yeah. But with those two movements, even if a person got a very powerful bridge, yeah, they do it mostly through the hips, but yes. they also involve their spine. Right. And of course, with inversion, there's a ton of spinal flexion. There's are those just inherently dangerous motions that you no. No, 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 Stephen. There's nothing that that's da inherently dangerous. Okay. No, it load is magnitude, it's duration, it's frequency, it's mitigated by rest and adaptation. So it just means that the exposure, the demand, is bigger than what the person is capable of. That's what's dangerous. Fair enough. So it's just it's a mismatch. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation and, and you're, I have to commend you. You are a very, very insightful man. Uh, I couldn't have, this. I'm resistant to everything except flattery. <laughs> I, I couldn't have this level of conversation with, with many people. I hope you appreciate that. Um, so that's what makes things dangerous. Uh, so now the person was ill prepared, perhaps, uh, and they hadn't created the resilience in their body to meet whatever that demand was. So a few cycles of uh, a compromised posture is uh, probably quite tolerable. That's the first half of my question. But the second half is people look at elite athletes as examples and think that they can be one, too. And this is a huge myth. So you take a guy like Kirillin. Do you remember the great Russian the experiment. Uh, who would su su yeah, su suplex everybody? Well, I, I won't. There are huge spaces between the posterior spines, as this model does, too. But if the average person did that, they would collide and crush the interspinous ligaments because that's the anatomical gift. So every elite athlete is, is a bit of a freak in a way. They are able to do something better than any other person in the world. When you look at the great jujitsu masters, they have very shallow hip sockets. They have to to get the femur right up and drop the knee up into the uh, shoulder. Now, do you know of many great jujitsu masters who have heavy skeletons? They don't exist. They have much thinner skeletons. If you take a thin willow branch, you can bend it back and forth with impunity. Stresses don't develop. If you take a thicker branch and bend it back and forth, it will shatter because the radial stress in a tube is a function of its, dis of its thickness, the distance from the neutral axis through to the outside. That's why a hollow tree can be very resilient in a windstorm because it's not the middle that, that supports the load. In other words, I wouldn't take an offensive tackle from the NFL and expect them to do really well in jujitsu, nor would I give them a sit-up because that thick spine creates far too much stress in bending. You take the next guy uh, who's a thinner skeleton, uh, they're suited for jujitsu. Beautiful. 
But I would take the bigger guy and I would have him do sabat or, you know, like the Russian martial art. Or uh, that's why, again, Robin Black and I have had wonderful discussions about why there's so many different martial arts forms. Look at the martial arts of the Zulu nation of Africa. You want to fight a guy who's seven foot tall? They have such unique advantages that they take advantage of. They're not going to do jujitsu, but you get a guy from Brazil who has that, they start with a flat back. Now, how many great Brazilian jiu-jitsu masters have a lot of lordosis when they stand? Very few, actually. They don't. Very few. Have you ever watched one run and sprint? They're not good sprinters because a good sprinter needs a lot of lordosis in their back. They've got to pre-turn the pelvis to get the expression of hip extensor power to sprint. But they won't kick you in the head. They won't get into high guard, but a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu master who's suited to the sport typically is a slender flame frame with a flatter back and, and a shallower hip socket. So do you see the stress that that human phenotype would have is very different than an offensive tackle who, uh, you know, even if they're slender, they'd be 260 <laughs> pounds. So uh, that's the second half of my question on, the, uh, or my answer on when we think of somebody who's amazing at jujitsu, the, the classic position or the classic example would be somebody who has an impassable right. guard when they're flat on their back that they can bring their knees up right, right. into their armpits. Right. And they, so is that depending on hip morphology? Is that a shallow hip socket? Right. The ability to put your leg wherever you want? Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the gift. And you're doing that at the expense of being able to run as fast or jump as high? Yeah, they won't sprint as fast. Yeah, that's so the 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 world's fastest sprinter is probably not going to be the best mm -hmm. jujitsu master, and 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 vice versa. Isn't that uh, that that's so interesting? But uh, let let me ask you a question. You know some pretty good jujitsu people. Sure. Do you know any in their sixties whose spines are happy? No, I can't really say that I do. Except the ones yeah. who've heavily well, modified their training. Ah. Oh, and they're they're maybe doing more teaching. The the professor emeritus kind of uh of jujitsu guy who just sits in the office and doesn't do anything. Of course now I'm Right. Oh, I hope so, you're not a professor you know, emeritus. I, you are, aren't you? I, I actually am. Oh no. Okay, well bad example then but, you know Stephen, i i am such an atypical professor don't there's no insult <laughs> don't worry <laughs> i was just thinking of some professor meritai that i've known back in the day who had the corner office and nobody went in there and they never did anything and they didn't even have a computer in there they just had all the old yeah. three inch by five inch filing cards on which they'd written their notes i mean to be frank from, that's why i left the university decades. i wanted to get out and do more, more things and work with more patients and, and that kind of thing for sure anyway so back to jiu-jitsu people with unhappy backs in their 60s when i think of the beefier people in jiu-jitsu the people the, the more muscular types with thick bones they they tend not to be guard players at all they, they tend very much to gravitate to the top position where they've got that driving pressure almost like a football player yeah well you know you, you look at the uh uh, the great, um, uh, well, do you know who Greg Jackson is? Yeah. Jackson and Winkle John. Yeah. yeah. So there is a master of the craft in terms of designing strategy. So a combat strategy here, you've got two martial artists. They have different combat skills. What can you do with one athlete to make their skill set superior in a, you know, a five minute round contest. And uh, th there's an example of, okay, this person uh, might have subject, suspect uh, endurance, but man, they've got the uh, hips and the uh, guard uh, skills that you've just mentioned. But then the trouble comes is when they can also knock you out off on their feet. <laughs> but anyway, these are the, the this is uh, these are fabulous questions. I'm so enjoying this. Are you enjoying oh, this? I'm very much so enjoying it. Yeah, this is this is fabulous. When I'm trying to think of the exceptions, 
right away my mind goes to George St. Pierre because I've seen him run. He's a very fast runner. I disagree. He's not fast. You disagree there? Yeah. Maybe I've seen a really well edited video at the optimal angle. He 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 is one of the the the, the best students of martial skills. He has one of the most disciplined minds. He is an absolute professor when it comes to working to understand why and and where of all of these uh, crafts. And the other thing that I I will say uh, in the era that he was in, not once did you hear him trash talk an opponent. He was, he did more for the UFC in terms of making it mainstream, giving it class. And, uh, you know, remember when it first came out, it was human cockfighting is, is what so many people uh, called it. Governments had banned it. And it was people like GSP that gave such grace and uh, intelligence to it all. And it changed a lot of people's minds. So, I mean, I'm going to say all of that about uh, GSP. He's 100%. Uh, to this day. Yeah. In terms of people who want to work on their back and on their spinal hygiene, uh, you've got a, a series of books, but is it the back mechanic that's best known? I, is that the one that's most uh, well distributed? Uh, certainly among the lay public. I, I never, when I started this, thought I'd ever write a book for the lay public. I'd always written books for, for doctors, for clinicians. So I wrote Low Back Disorders, which is really an opus on what causes back pain. and it's But it's a bunch of medical gobbledygook for the average person. And there were different groups that came to me and said, you know, we, we struggled through low back disorders. Would you write one for us, for the lay public? And Back Mechanic was the most difficult book I, it took me five years. I kept going back and forth between the editor and the publisher saying, this book wasn't going to sell. You have to have a title, fix your back in five easy steps. And I said, I'm not doing it. It's a lie. It's a myth. That's not what we do. So the book is 17 chapters. and uh, But at least it guides them through a sensible self-assessment, getting rid of the cause, building some pain-free resilience, and then building sufficient athleticism to get through life without pain. So that, but but I still had to have enough content that it was truthful and helpful, but I had to keep it simple. So do you know that dance? That dance took me five years. Um, There's a book for coaches that I wrote, Ultimate Back Fitness, uh, yeah, Ultimate Back Fitness and Performance. I don't know if you have a copy of that, but uh, if you don't, I'll give me your address, I'll send you one. But uh, that is now you're out of pain. Let's recognize your pain history and keep the adaptations going, building you back to uh, higher levels of performance. The Gift of Injury was one I wrote with Brian Carroll, and it was his story coming from being a very disabled athlete through to lifting uh, the highest in human history. Anyway. It would be remiss of me to not mention that you also have a book on golf. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think golf is a sport, personally. I think it's a game. <laughs> I think it's a death of athleticism. I've got a personal vendetta against golf. But you do have a, a book about how to play through golf and not screw your back up. Oh, oh, it is such a challenge to rehabilitate someone who has uh, been through hell with their back Uh, And no one plays golf for back health. They play despite it. And I'm going to say the same thing about jujitsu. No one says, oh, I'm going to do some back exercise. I'll get into jujitsu. No, it's the opposite. You get your back in shape to do jujitsu and to play golf. Um, But uh, again, it's such a unique sport. It's certainly misunderstood from a medical point of view. But to rebuild uh, golfers, of of which we've we've done several times, bring them back to the the, the top of their game. Uh, And it's not a book. That's a DVD, actually, a video. And it's called The New Science of Golf. And I would measure some very good golfers and how they hit a ball. Uh, There's all sorts of material and opinions on the Internet about the golf swing. But we measured the neurology, the muscle patterns, 
and uh, those kinds of things to see what really does create a long ball and how can you hack your way around uh, uh, golf induced back pain. I've, I've heard you say or, or read that you said, I can't remember which it is, that high level golfers tend to have smaller spines. They don't tend not to have that thick spine so that it doesn't suffer as much from the rotation. Well, if, uh, if uh, golf was all about strength, the NFL linebackers would be doing pretty well at it. But I don't know one who hit a long golf ball. In fact, you'd be amazed at when you measure the athleticism of those who hit a long ball. Uh, most of them are uh, smaller and more slender. Uh, then there are those who uh, train heavy. I mean, there's been fabulous case studies where they got into Olympic lifting and all this kind of stuff, and they had brilliant flameouts. You can't stress your hips and your back and your knees with Olympic lifting and have a golf career that lasts. You will do well for a short period of time. Uh, and we saw that time and time again. Now, I think that era is, has gone past us now. And pretty much every one of those athletes who rebuilt their career uh, train much more like uh, I've described in the video. But when you look at, you know, the Gary players, the uh, Jack Nicklaus, uh, Arnold Palmer, uh, I don't know any of them that uh, lifted heavy. <laughs> yeah, I know that you have a, a network of clinicians of people who've trained under you. So I'm, I'm assuming if you live in West Texas, they won't be able to travel up to Canada to train with you. So how, how do they find the people who've been trained by you if they want to work directly with someone? Well, I don't want to see them right now anyway, and the border's closed. But uh, uh, if they go to our website, backfitpro.com, and then there's two portals, one for clinicians coming in to get their materials, and then one for patients coming in. And they will see uh, certified people in the McGill method. And then they will see the cream of the crop, the elite clinicians who I have personally trained. Uh, I've worked with them to ensure that they get patients better. Uh they're called our master clinicians, and they're on an, another page of the website. Um, I wish we had more, but it takes me a long time to train one. Well, I, I think you've had a, a massive effect through your books and through your appearances and through working with athletes and coming on podcasts such as this. So it's, and now your network of clinicians. So thank you very much for today and congratulations on how much you've achieved and moved the needle well thanks Stephen, and and thanks back to you for uh supporting this and all that you do and uh our discussion today was uh one of the most enjoyable in in memory you you really thank you so much brought out some good things and i thank you for that <laughs>